Welcome to the, uh, meeting, the monthly meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. We meet every uh, third Monday of the month now, and uh, you're welcome to all future meetings. This current meeting is a uh, talk on Cars 2 by uh, Neil Luck. Thank you, Neil. Okay, well, thank you, David. Um, the original talk was, as you know, was entitled The Backstory Behind the War on Cars in the UK. Um, due to various complicated circumstances, we weren't able to video it that night, and so we're going to do it tonight. And so, after the great success of Cars, we've now got Cars 2. Um, let's get straight into the detail then. Uh, on the 8th of April of this year, Sadiq Khan's ultra-low emissions zone, ULEZ, went live in the congestion charge area in central London. And it now costs the driver £12.50 a day, on top of the congestion charge, to drive in this zone a diesel car that was built before September 2015, or a petrol car built before 2006. Now that is a rather outrageous amount, as I'm sure you'd agree, uh, and it also has to be paid at weekends. And the plan is to extend this to all of the area inside the North and South Circular Roads in October 2021. I think it may have got a bit later than that since then, but uh, after that, who knows? It could be all over the country by 2025. Beyond this, there is talk of charging drivers of diesel cars to enter any of 35 or so cities around the UK. Um, there are some, particularly Southampton, which have decided not to do it, but there are several which are pressing on, Birmingham being an example of that. And meanwhile, and this was uh, in May, the Times started a campaign claiming that uh, air pollution on the streets is poisoning 2.6 million school children, and it's all due to clogged roads. And yet, on that very same week, uh, in the first week of May, Sky News had a poll and they showed that well more than 50% of people in the UK are unwilling to significantly reduce the amount they drive, or indeed the amount they fly, or the amount they eat meat. People are basically not interested in combating climate change or protecting the environment, they want to live their lives. And there is a huge disconnect here between the political classes and the people. Now, there's a very long backstory behind all this, which not many people seem to be aware of. I have managed to put, over the last couple of years, a lot of this backstory together. So tonight I want to bring it out into the open for you. And in the process, I'll identify what I call 10 deadly dishonesties. Uh, these are deceitful plays that, ploys that anti-car and other green campaigners have used many of them more than once in this backstory. So my talk will consist of five parts. Part one will be a very brief history of the Green Agenda in general, and the part that's been played by the United Nations in particular. In part two, I'll touch on global warming, which is the central plank of the Green Agenda. Now, I know that Nico did a uh, presentation for you a few months ago, and if you listen to that, you're already an expert on the science. So I will talk about the history and the politics. In part three, I'll talk briefly about the background and the regulatory framework within which all this is happening. And then in parts four and five, I will look into the two kinds of pollution which are used as excuses for this war on our cars. Particulate matter, which is known as PM, and specifically PM 2.5, and nitrogen oxides, which collectively are known as NOx. So let's talk about the green agenda in general to start. The United Nations has been the driver of the Green Agenda all along. Right from back in 1970, when we had the first Earth Day, the then Secretary General, U Thant, personally sanctioned the idea of an Earth Day. And in 1972, the UN started what was called the UN Environment Programme, and it was under the directorship of Maurice Strong. Now, you may have heard of Maurice Strong. Um, he was a Canadian oil baron, um, and he had a very scandal-ridden career but he was a very much an environmentalist and very much a UN person, and he is probably responsible for these troubles more than any other individual. Strong, in 1997, let off the following quote, Frankly, we may get to the point where the only way of saving the world will be for industrial civilization to collapse. That's pretty nasty stuff, and that's number one right, that's in my list a thinly disguised hatred of the industrial civilization, which has given us so much, including, of course, given Maurice Strong so much. Strong, fortunately, is no longer with us. He went to live in China after he was implicated in the oil for food 
scandal in 2005, and he died in 2015. Now, things moved along in the United Nations, and in 1982, they introduced a resolution, a UN resolution called the World Charter for Nature. And this included extreme statements like, Activities which might have an impact on nature shall be controlled. Uh, and this World Charter, would you believe, was passed by 111 votes to one with 18 abstentions. Only the USA voted against. So even the UK didn't vote against. Uh, in 1987, the UN produced a report called Our Common Future, which laid out a blueprint for the green future, and this all led to the Rio summit at which idiot politicians like John Major signed up to their agenda. The way I like to put it is they sold us all down the Rio. <laughs> to summarize, in environmental matters, don't believe the United Nations or anyone associated with it. Now, I'll say very little about uh, our common future, that report. In 2017, I wrote a head post about this report, which was published at whatsupwiththat.com. And those of you in the know will know that is the world's number one climate skeptic website. So I have four, I think it may even be five head posts there. I go through every day. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> um, it's a couple of years, or 18 months or so since I had one, but um, that was my first one. And this 1987 report, which I reviewed on its 30th anniversary, this was where the globalist and internationalist strand of the United Nations activity the world government strand, and the environmentalist strand first fused together. And Maurice Strong was, of course, on the commission, 23 Strong Commission that produced this report. Now, the report raised alarms on 14 particular environmental issues, and they included the three that are currently being actively pushed. First of all, the species loss, which keeps on coming up, although there's never any, any real evidence for it. Secondly, acid rain, which they later rebadged as air quality. That's the one that is causing the cars problems. Uh, and the third one is global warming. Now, in terms of the car, interestingly, our common future in 1987 focused mainly on cars in third world countries and cities. The agenda to force people in the West out of our cars came later, a few years later. But our common future is not very nice report it has pieces of rhetoric like development involves a progressive transformation of economy and society hum and we are serving notice that the time has come to take the decisions needed and the politicians bought all this stuff so we come to the rio earth summit in 1992 there were several agreements there are two in ones which are important to what I'll say tonight. First of all, there was the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that was a binding convention, and that led to the, led to the yearly Conference of the Parties meeting, COP, which I'm sure you're aware of, and in particular, it led directly to the meetings in Copenhagen in 2009 and in Paris in 2015, both of which aimed to reach binding agreements to keep global temperatures below some totally arbitrary limit. In 2015, interestingly, it looked as if global warming had stopped because from about 1995 to 2015, there wasn't any until the big super El Nino that happened down that year. It looked like it had stopped and wasn't going to reach 2 degrees centigrade. So they just arbitrarily lowered the limit to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Would you believe? This is the second of my 10 deadly dishonesties, moving the goalposts. And when we get to PM 2.5, I'll show you an even more egregious one of the example of that. The other one was Agenda 21. I, I have to say, I read it and I wished I hadn't. Uh, it was 350 pages of bureaucraties in which the word women occurs more than 250 times. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to count how many times the word men occurred, other than in women, but it wasn't very many. And it had all these wonderful pieces of rhetoric. Significant changes in the consumption patterns of industries, governments, households, and individuals. And favoring high occupancy public transport. And this was where the anti-car agenda came in. It came in with Agenda 21 in 1992. 
And the clever thing, and I'm sure this was a Morris Strong brainwave, it was to be implemented at the local government level. So it passed under most people's radar. radar. At the time, it even passed under my radar, although I wasn't at that time particularly active in this area. So now I'll go on to part two of my talk, which is about the global warming. Now the accusation, namely that human emissions of carbon dioxide are causing what I give the letter CAGW, which is catastrophic anthropogenic global warming. In other words, it's warming, it's global, it's caused by humans, and it's going to be catastrophic. That accusation appears to be a factual matter. It ought to be easy to establish the facts beyond reasonable doubt. And the way to do that, obviously, is to use honest and unbiased science. And then if the accusation turns out to be true, you can make a decision that's fair to everyone. And yet what we have is not that at all. What we have is a highly charged rumpus. The global warming narrative is peddled at the tops of all their voices by the government and virtually all the establishment media. Or virtually all the newspapers. The Times, The Independent, The Guardian. And most of all, of course, the BBC. They're the worst of the lot. And people who are sceptical of that narrative are labelled with nasty things like deniers or flat earthers. Now, just to come back a little bit to the United Nations involvement, in 1988, the United Nations set up the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is a United Nations organization, and of course this was all done because the very first politician in the world to really make global warming into a hot political football was none other than a certain Margaret Thatcher. May she rot in hell. Uh, the IPCC has prepared five major reports. The first one was in 1990, and the most recent was in 2013. And these things are produced in a very interesting way. Parts of the reports, including the summary, which is the summary for policymakers, which is the, uh, the keynote part of it, they are actually approved line by line by government officials. And in 1996, at the second report, something very interesting happened. A section of the summary was reworded in a more alarmist way at the request of governments, including the UK. And then the technical reports were updated to match. <coughs> this is the third of my ten deadly dishonesties, politics disguised as if it was science. Now the current state, as far as I know, it's in the sixth assessment cycle, and that's going on for an unusually long time. It's not due to be complete until 2022. What they seem to be doing is they seem to be publishing another small alarmist report every few months until then. So they're just keeping the pot boiling. There are, of course, lots of uh, technical difficulties with the, uh, with the science in this case. The temperature data that we have to work on, I mean, the first thing you ought to have to say is, well, <laughs> is the temperature actually increasing? Well, the amounts that they're saying, the claimed year-on-year -year differentials, as we call them, each year they're of the order of hundredths of a degree. And that's way smaller than the error margins in the temperature measurements, which are typically 50 or 100 times that. Temperatures are only measured to half a degree centigrade, or even one degree centigrade in the older things. Thanks for the water, by the way. Um, on top of that, the temperature data is incomplete. It's incomplete spatially. There are lots of places we haven't got any data for. It's incomplete chronologically. There are lots of times that we haven't got um, any data for. And obviously, the further back you go, the uh, worse it gets. Um, but also, there was a, in the, I think the early 1990s, there was a huge decrease in the number of thermometers around the world that were being used for this monitoring. It was blamed on the collapse of the Soviet Union, but I don't think that was entirely what was going on. You can make of that what you will. Also, this data includes measurements made by different means, ships, putting buckets over the side, and buoys and satellites, and by instruments, thermometers of different types and at different times of day. And many of the sites on land are of low quality. They're near asphalt, or they're right next to air conditioning outlets. And one of the problems we get is that many of the measurements are adjusted, often in ways that are documented very poorly, or not even documented at all. And more often than not, guess what? They either cool the past or warm the present. 
there's a suspicion among skeptics that the data is being doctored to fit the theory. That would be another dis deadly dishonesty, but I cannot, certainly cannot prove it. I don't think anyone can prove that. On top of that, um, the raw data is noisy and full of errors. And then we have satellite temperature data, which has sets of problems all its own, adjustments and satellites drifting. And it's not just the temperature data. data. Uh, there are similar things happening with sea levels. Now, we know that sea levels have been rising for about 12,000 years, and it's been pretty steady rise. Um, and there are huge differences that have become apparent between the trends from satellite measurements of sea level and the tide gauge measurements. The tide gauges consistently show much lower trends. Neither trend seems to be changing much, but we keep on seeing new papers that claim to show a recent acceleration in the trend. So I don't know what they're doing. Are they managing to switch surreptitiously from the one measurement to the other? I, I cannot claim to be an expert in this area, but something's going on. Moreover, the actual case for alarm is built almost entirely on computer models. So they put their assumptions, physical assumptions, into uh, computer programs, and they run them step by step. And of course, you get all the problems with chaos theory that you get when you approach uh, complicated differential equations in that kind of way. And as you'd expect, the results of the model runs are all over the place. And even after they've gone through all the homogenizations and adjustments, the models still consistently run hotter than the real-world measurements, even after they fiddled about with them to make them look worse than they probably are. The problem with models is they're not used, and the IPCC admits this, they're not used to make specific predictions that can be tested as the scientific model, as the scientific method demands. You're supposed to make a prediction. My hypothesis suggests that this will happen. Then you measure or not whether this thing happens. And if it doesn't, you've got to modify your hypothesis. But no, they only make projections, which cannot be falsified. And that, of course, goes against the strict use of the scientific method. And another problem there, how do we know that the models built-in assumptions, because computer programmers have assumptions built in, and as one who tests software professionally, <laughs> I know that every programmer builds in his own set of assumptions to every program. Uh, and how do we know that these things don't simply reflect the prejudices of the modelers? So, then there is something I call nonsense. Nonsense is non-science, but it rhymes with nonsense. Um, and there's technical nonsense, we see unrelated data being grafted together without explanation. For example, Michael Mann's hockey stick was a good example of that. He put instrumental temperatures on the end of some proxy records from the past from trees. Then we see data inconvenient to the alarmist case being dropped altogether, as for the 1999 brochure cover for the World Meteorological Organization. Data that was inconveniently going in the opposite direction was just airbrushed. We see dubious statistical methods, which produce hockey sticks from random noise, or they exaggerate the contribution of an extremely small sample of trees. There was one famous case of a single tree actually coming out with a hockey stick, just the single thing in among a whole lot of trees, causing a hockey stick to appear in the, in the data, in the proxy data. Uh, and there have also been attempts to minimize or even to suppress the medieval warm period. Now, as any historian of the period will tell you, from about 950 to 1250 AD, it was quite a lot warmer than it is now. And that was the period in which European commerce as a whole started to take off. And they had farming in Greenland at that time. And then in about the 1400s, all that died off. It suddenly got too cold again. So that's the technical nonsense. Then we have the media nonsense. They misrepresent the truth with clever graphs and narratives. The hockey stick again is a good example of that. And they spread alarmism with these clever things, the graphs and narratives. We've seen photoshopped pictures on the front covers of journals. Many of you may remember the Polar Blair. Polar Bear. <laughs> polar Blair. That was a Freudian <laughs> one. <laughs> the Polar Bear on the ice flow. Yeah. Um, that was actually been photoshopped onto, onto the ice flow. It was never anywhere near it. And we keep on being told it's worse than we thought. 97% of climate scientists agree that global warming is a big problem. Well, in the original case where that data came, it was 97% of a sample of 79 of them 
that was culled from something over 11,000 papers. So <laughs> that's not 97%. And of course we are told that the science is settled and we keep on getting told this when we know very well anyone who knows anything about science knows that science never is settled. And then we've had what I call procedural nonsense. And this was shown up with the Climate Gate emails, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. They refuse to release or share their data, which makes it impossible for third-party scientists to replicate their results, or indeed to show that their results were wrong. There have been cases where they have deleted data in order to evade freedom of information requests. And that's all there in the climate gate emails. And we've seen them trying to stop publication of skeptical papers. Skeptical scientists and journal editors have been persecuted. And one even, I believe James Sayers was his name, was actually sacked from his journal editorship for publishing papers that were skeptical of the party line. So that's number five. Number four, number four is refusing to release and share data. And number five of the deadly dishonesties is suppressing dissenting scientific views. And then in 2009, we got Climate Gate. The release of emails from the Climatic Research Unit, University of East Anglia, which I'm always tempted to call the Climactic Research Unit myself, um, that showed proof positive that all this stuff was going on, all this nonsense. The UK government in response committed three three inquiries, none of which did the job properly. There was a parliamentary committee which chose to avoid the important questions. I will give a plaudit to Graham Stringer, the Labour MP. He tried to keep them focused, but they didn't listen to him. Uh, the, then there was the Oxborough inquiry, which didn't listen to the critics of the CRU, the Climatic Research Unit, and it didn't cover the controversial areas. And most importantly, it didn't look at all at work that was done for the IPCC. And then there was the Muir Russell in inquiry, which was supposed to investigate was the science being done well and was it being done properly and honestly? And it really just identified, it investigated the side issues. So all the most important issues simply fell through the gaps between the three inquiries. And there was one, I think it was the UK's chief scientist who said something to the effect of um, it was Oxborough's inquiry was a blinder well played. And I think I know what the word blinder means. Pulling blindfolds over people's eyes. And then the most egregious of all the bad things they have done is actually, I have another head post on this one, what's up with that, is much more subtle. They have perverted the precautionary principle, even inverted it. Now, in its original form, the precautionary principle says, look before you leap. And it's very, very sensible. I even prefer the stronger version, which is the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Don't do anything unless you're sure, or pretty sure, that it's going to be, have a beneficial effect. And in that version of the precautionary principle, the burden of proof has always got to be on those wanting to act, and most of all, most particularly if they're a government. And this is just like the presumption of innocence in criminal trials. The reason for the presumption of innocence is the state's got all that power and you have to have a chance. But the UK government in 2002 rewrote the precautionary principle and they changed its purpose too. And I quote, to create an impetus to take a decision, notwithstanding scientific uncertainty about the nature and extent of the risk. Exclamation mark. They also used the mantra, which is attributed to Carl Sagan, and is very easy to misuse, absence of evidence of risk is not evidence of absence of risk. And they seemed to be trying to pervert it into absence of evidence of guilt is not evidence of absence of guilt. That's the message that came over. And I actually have a copy of the, the PDF of the documents in which they did that. And here's three more. Oh, by the way, number six of the deadly dishonesties was the white government whitewash. Number seven is inverting the burden of proof. Number eight is negating the presumption of innocence. And number nine is requiring the accused to prove a negative. And if you wonder why requiring the accused to prove a negative is a problem, how would you prove that there are no fairies at the bottom of your garden? Okay, I would say, I've got, haven't got a garden, but I can get away with it. <laughs> But how would you do it? If you have a garden, how would you prove there are no fairies there? You can't. Then we come back to the climate change bill. 
2008. I actually read through all the documentation for that, and it was bleh, horrible. Uh, they made a token attempt at a cost-benefit analysis, but there was a factor of seven in uncertainty in the costs and a factor of 12 in the benefits of action to so-called mitigate climate change. That's if we could believe the figures in the first place. Those numbers are completely useless numbers of that type for making any kind of objective decisions. And yet the politicians didn't care. They just went ahead anyway and voted for the climate change bill. And that is the la tenth and last of my deadly dishonesties. Making costly commitments on behalf of other people and people you're supposed to be serving without any rigorous justification. And yet here we are with the idiots in Parliament, Michael Gove in particular, declaring there's a climate emergency on no evidence whatsoever, and Theresa May even echoing it in her last few days as Prime Minister. So, that's the end of part two. Now the background in the regulatory framework. DEFRA, who are the government agency responsible for pollution, they produce yearly stats on emissions of air pollutants from all sources. The progress we've made in reducing emissions since back in 1970 has been really impressive. PM2.5 emissions in 2015 were less than a quarter of the levels in 1970. NOx emissions were also down to less than a third. However, since about 2005, the reduction in PM2.5 emissions slowed. I think what happened was they had picked all the low-hanging fruit, things like scrubbers on coal-fired power plants, which wouldn't cost huge amounts, Last I looked, they were roughly static in, from year to year, but I haven't looked for a couple of years. Now on the anti-car movement in the UK, they started in the 1970s, uh, perhaps even before, but it was in 1993, right after Rio, that the war on cars began in the UK, and I remember the propaganda machine getting going. And I wrote in an article, which was a few years later, our TV screens showed staged pictures of rural roads chock-a-block with cars of traffic jams in foggy weather, complete with smoking exhaust pipes, of the aftermaths of accidents. It was hard, even then, to avoid thinking that we drivers were being set up. And I also noted that organisations that should have defended us, for example the AA, the Automobile Association, looked the other way, or even added their voices to the witch hunt. And I actually left the AA in protest at that, uh, though I have since had to rejoin them, because the RSE tried ripping me off. <laughs> However, yeah. Um, anyway, what have the government's responses been to the anti-car movement? Well, Tony Blair's government was extremely anti-car. Almost the very first law they passed was the Road Traffic Reduction Act, 1997. In 1999, Blair and co. agreed the Gothenburg Protocol, and this Gothenburg Protocol was instigated by, guess who, the United Nations. And this set controls on emissions of pollutions, not on concentrations, which had previously been the way things had been done, but no, on emissions. And it covered a range of pollutants, including PM2.5 and NOx, the ones we're talking about. Here is another case of the tenth deadly dishonesty, making commitments, which proved to be costly, on behalf of others without any rigorous justification. That was the start of the time that we had of creeping speed limits, including 20 miles an hour, speed bumps, bus lanes, congestion charges, smart motorways, cameras everywhere to catch us out. And the coalition and the Tories have been no better, all the parties that are in on the scam. In fact, the Cameron was even worse, because in 2012, at least Blair's limits could have been possibly kept to. But Cameron and co. agreed in 2012 to an extension to the Gothenburg Protocol, which set far more stringent limits on emissions to 2020 and even more stringent ones to 2030. And they even went to the UN offices in Geneva. They flew to the UN offices in Geneva to sign this damn thing. That is a, another clear case of making costly commitments on behalf of others without any rigorous justification. And they should have been done for making commitments they should have known couldn't be met. So let's now just look at where we are. The EU historically has set targets and limits. Now these are set on concentrations, not on emissions, which is actually sensible if you're going to have such things because effects, health effects, are caused by concentrations, not by emissions. Targets are in 
EU speak or DEFRA speak are to be attained where possible by taking all necessary measures not entailing disproportionate costs. And limits are legally binding EU parameters that must not be exceeded. But there's a little wrinkle. Targets get set at a given time and then five years later they have a habit of morphing into limits on some totally arbitrary cut-off date. So what becomes a difficult to achieve, but we're trying to sort it out problem, suddenly you're in breach of the, with the EU. And that commitment for, to 2020 on PM 2.5 is not going to happen. There isn't a hope in hell it's going to happen, which is why this is a live issue now. And that's why we've got all this rubbish going on this year, and it's only going to get worse. The fact is that Cameron made a commitment that couldn't ever possibly be met, and Cameron ought to be held to account, personally, in my view. Anyway, the EU does something that is not quite so bad. It sets emission standards for new cars. Um, now, diesel cars, as you may know, emit both of these pollutants, PM2.5 and NOx. Petrol cars emit some NOx, but a lot less than diesels, and very little PM2.5. <coughs> There's also an uncertain amount of particulate matter that comes from tyres and brakes, although DEFRA seem to think that most of this is of a larger size than PM2.5, so it's actually much, much less toxic, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. So not a big problem, but that is still being made out to be a big problem, pollution from tyres and brakes. And that's where the, those who are actually trying to stop cars altogether, even electric cars, are coming from. Now, every five years or so, the EU makes new and tighter standards for new cars. Uh, Euro 3 was made in 2001, Euro 4 in 2006, Euro 5 came into effect in September 2010, that's for cars sold from those times, and Euro 6 in September 2015. Um, and these have been tightened a lot. Euro 5 and 6 diesels produced only a tenth as much PM as Euro 3 models did. And that's a tremendous, tremendous gain. Um, the NOx standards have also been tightened, although this has become somewhat moot since the Volkswagen diesel scandal. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about particulate matter. What is PM 2.5? Uh, it's small airborne particles, and the 2.5 means they're less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. Now, the adverse health effects from PM are believed to come almost entirely from PM 2.5, because these are the particles that are small enough to get through the body's defenses into the lungs and they can also potentially carry chemical poisons such as nickel and arsenic. I've heard that the Chinese were looking at vanadium as a possible problem, um, but I'm a bit surprised about this because my reading is that's <coughs> less than 15, vanadium is less than 15 times as, sorry, less than a 15th as toxic as PM 2.5 is claimed to be, so there's something a bit strange there. The problem with PM 2.5 is that these particles tend to remain in the air for quite a long time, so the pollution can travel a long way from its source, even across national borders, which makes it a perfect weapon for the UN and the EU to use to bind national governments, and so to control their people. Also, the experts say that PM 2.5 is very difficult to measure with any confidence. <laughs> Basically, you cannot measure it accurately. And the mechanism by which PM 2.5 causes its claimed effects is not well understood. And we can contrast this with, for example, arsenic, which is of a comparable level of toxicity. Arsenic, I think, is about three or four times as toxic as PM2.5 is claimed to be. And we all know how arsenic does what it does. It impersonates phosphorus and stops life-giving molecules from working. But we don't know how PM2.5 does what it does. We don't know it. Uh, because the important statistic, an average Londoner breathes in only about five grams of PM 2.5 in a lifetime. This actually stat comes from one of the experts, but I repeated the calculation myself and got 4.6. So I know he's in the right ballpark. So we really do need to understand exactly what it is that makes it as toxic as it's claimed to be, but we don't. Now the backstory. In the 1980s, there was data collected in the USA, notably from industrial areas in Ohio, to see if there might be a correlation between PM 2.5 and mortality rates. There were two major studies came out of this, the Harvard Six Cities study of 1993, is the date significant, question mark, and the American Cancer Society's Cancer Prevention Study 2 in 1995. 
They both were trying to link PM2.5 and mortality. They both claimed to show a risk factor of about 6% for inhaling PM2.5 at concentrations typical of those we have in the UK in urban areas. That's equivalent to, it's very arcane, the mathematics of toxicology, uh, that's equivalent to about 5% of adults who die, die from this cause. That sounds high to me, 5%. There are a lot more ways you can die than through pollution from something you breathe five grams of in a lifetime. <clears throat> uh, and there are still huge uncertainties, and other studies, for example, in California, have been made that have not shown any such correlation. So we might not only not have causation, we might not uh, even not have correlation. Just as with global warming, there have been dissenting scientists who have been victimized. There's a, an epidemiologist, epidemiologist called James Enstrom um, from the UCLA. He used to work with the American Cancer Society, but they cut off his funding in the early 1990s. I think it was in 1994. He's been victimized for his view that his passive smoking isn't harmful. UCLA actually tried to sack him at one point, and he had to take it to court to keep tenure. So that is another of my deadly dishonesties. That is the one suppressing dissenting scientific views. And in 2000, there was a specially set up US scientific team called the Health Effects Institute, which was allowed access to the data. They reported that they had replicated and validated the original studies, but no independent scientists were allowed access to the data. So this could perfectly easily have been an inside job, and it has all the trappings. It has all the looks of being an inside job. So red flag, could this be a whitewash as well? And of course, could it be politics masquerading as science? Almost certainly, yes. In 2009, the UK government and their Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollution, called CONIAP, they tried to work out how big a problem PM2.5 was in the UK. And they accepted the 6% risk factor from the US Cancer Prevention Study. Now, the scientific basis on which they accepted this risk factor is not clear. I have read their report several times through, and I cannot understand why they accepted it. Um, and they tried a novel way of estimating the uncertainty, which amounted, in essence, to seven experts, each waving a wet finger in the air and pulling the results. <laughs> I kid you not, each of them said, over a range of 0 up to 18%, they put down the chances that they thought it was in each one, and they then pulled all the results, and they came out with an average of 6%. And the result was a factor of 12 between their lower and upper bounds. And, and that's with the 75% criterion on the plausibility level, not 95, the standard in stats, <laughs> or 99.5%, which is what you use for really good work, really top work. And then in 2010, a follow-up report from the UK government concluded that in 2008, PM2.5 had caused nearly 29,000 deaths in the UK, with an average loss of life expectancy of 11.7 years. But it could have been anywhere between 4,700 and 51,000. Well, that's not data, that's data which is not fit for purpose. Now, the original data has a funny backstory too. In 2013, after the Republicans had taken control, control of the House of Representatives, they issued a subpoena to the EPA for the original data, and the EPA still managed to release it. Question, could we have another of the deadly dishonesties? Might they have deleted it or hidden it away? Um, what I have heard since is that other scientists have been allowed access to versions of the data, which have been anonymized and all that, but of course they don't know it was the actual data. They cannot tell, no one can tell. And the question is, of course, would it have stood up to scrutiny if someone under the right confidentiality arrangements had gone through it? Or would the study's conclusions have been overturned? So, we have not been able to replicate it, and James Enstrom has not been able to replicate the study in because if he would prove it, if it's wrong, he could prove it's wrong. Now, on PM2.5 in the UK specifically, the EU limit for PM2.5 since 2015, that's limits since 2015, is 25 micrograms per cubic metre. I'll call those units for brevity. The current average in London is about 14 units. A few sites in central London are above 20, 
But as of 2015, there was no place in London at which the EU limit was broken. The UK-wide level is very close to slightly under 10 units, and that's for urban sites and for roadside sites. And recently, the PM2.5 emitted by wood-burning stoves has been increasing rapidly. Why has it been increasing rapidly? Because government has been subsidised, word subsidising wood-burning stoves, and it's estimated that burning wood now produces twice as much PM2.5 as all road traffic put together. Complete and total madness. Whoever set up that wood-burning incentive should be held responsible. Now, the accusation that is being levied against us on PM2.5, and I'm going to quote from The Guardian here, <laughs> October 2017 in The Guardian, Every person in the capital is breathing air that exceeds global guidelines for one of the most dangerous toxic particles. Every area in the capital exceeds World Health Organization WHO limits for a damaging type of particle known as two, PM2.5. Nearly 95% of the capital's population live in areas that exceed the limit by 50% or more. In central London, the average annual levels are almost double the WHO limit. Now, let it sink in the fact that the WHO is a United Nations organization, and I'll then ask the question, did you see the goalposts move there? The EU limit is 25 units. The WHO guideline figure is 10 units. 40% of the EU limit. Where is the science behind the WHO's figure? Now, I have heard, I, I haven't managed to confirm this, that what that figure actually is, is this is the highest figure at which it has been proven that there are no effects from PM2.5. So that is a very unfair measure to use when actually looking at real world effects. And the date on this figure, the issue of this guideline is very interesting, 2005, the last year in which Maurice Strong was still involved. And it's a lot worse than that, actually. It's far worse than that, because there's a background level of PM2.5 which wouldn't be there without any human activity at all, at all. Experts say that this is about 7 micrograms per cubic metre, 7 units. So between the EU limit and the background level is 18 units, 25 minus 7. Between the WHO guideline and the background is 3 units, 10 minus 7. Factor of 6, we'd have to reduce the human component of PM2.5 by a factor of six in order to meet the EU, uh, the WHO guideline. And basically that means destroying industrial civilization. And that's the Morris Strong hatred for industrial civilization. Morris Strong must be laughing in his grave. Now where I personally came into the story. I was trained as a mathematician, so I know how to do calculations. And in the summer of 2017, I set out to answer objectively the question, are the proposed levels of charges for entry to the London ULEZ reasonable or are they a gross ripoff? So I wrote a paper in which I calculated what's called the social cost, that is the total expense to all those affected of the effects of pollution from cars in the UK. I used the government's figures for those reports that were done in 2009 and 2010. Uh, my paper was published by the Association of British Drivers, and later it was also published at whatsappwiththat.com. I have the only paper on pollution published at WhatsApp with that, as far as I'm aware. I worked out the social cost of PM emissions from diesel cars in the UK in 2008 as £183 per car per year. Now, that is significant, but it's way lower than the perceived value of cars to the people who drive them, which is roughly at least £5,000 a year, 3,500 running cost and 1,500 capital cost, if you depreciate a 12,000 pound car over eight years. I also broke these down costs, costs down by the Euro standard of the cars, and things have got much better since 2008, because the Euro 5 standard came in from 2010, and that's 10 times lower than before, well, before than the Euro 3. So a Euro 5 diesel, which is what I happen to drive, and a Euro 6 diesel, the Social cost of PM2.5 from those diesel is just £21, and that is peanuts compared with the benefit. Although I heard that some 
maniacs, they must be maniacs from the academic world, had published a paper claiming that it was £8,000 a year per car was the cost, social cost. So, I mean, yes, I can see how they can get a factor of two or three, but no, <laughs> there's not a factor of 400. So anyway, that's PM2.5. Oh, and NOx is in some ways even more fun. Um, NOx, as you know, is a combination of two oxides with nitrogen, nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide. It's produced mainly by diesel engines from cars. It's also produced by other diesels like marine diesels. It's also produced by petrol cars. It's very unclear indeed just how toxic NOx is. If you think it's unclear how toxic PM2.5 is, NOx, I don't think there is even a consensus among experts that it's actually itself toxic at all. The only problems it gives is the secondary PM2.5. It's called secondary PM2.5 when nitrogen oxides <coughs> react with other things in the air, notably ammonia. But I looked up, okay, most of what you get is ammonium nitrate, and ammonium nitrate is not toxic at all, so <laughs> there's something very strange going on there as well. Anyway, to the backstory. In 2001, Tony Blair, David King, the scientific advisor, and Gordon Brown, offered incentives to drivers to buy, and so to manufacturers to make, diesel cars. And they did it because diesels, I have to stop myself laughing, emit less CO2. In 2006, insiders at the European Federation for Transport and Environment found out that in the real world, the emissions of NOx from diesel engines were much higher than the limits were supposedly built to meet. Because those cars were supposedly built to meet. And in 2009, the London Air Quality Network's report for 2006 and 7, which came out a year late, identified that the EU limit for NOx was being exceeded in many places in London. Curiously, the 2008, 2009 and 2010 reports were not published until 2012. Is this an attempt at a government whitewash? Because by now, Gordon Brown, the original architect of the 2001 scheme, was Prime Minister. Did Brown have them suppressed? I don't know. Anyway, in 2014, the European Commission took the UK to court for exceeding NOx limits. And that's where the anti-diesel stuff all came in. In 2015, DEFRA followed up their earlier one on PM2.5 with a report on NOx pollution. And it gave a central estimate of 23,500 deaths in the year 2013, with an error range of a factor of four. I could not find out where that factor of four came from, but my gut feel is probably a gross underestimate. Um, it is not clear at all how much overlap there might be with deaths caused by PM2.5 pollution. It could be as much as 100%, 100% in which case you can just ignore this figure altogether. And they also admitted that the previous estimates for PM2.5 may well have been too high. And then, at almost exactly the same time, the Volkswagen diesel scandal erupted in the USA, and what insiders had known since 2006 now became public knowledge. Now, my guess is that what happened is the EU got all uppity about this and told the manufacturers that they wouldn't sell, allow them to sell their cars in the EU unless they met the standards. The manufacturers realised they couldn't make the cars meet the standards, so they cheated. I, I'm pretty sure that must, must be what happened, uh, reading between the lines. And then in 2016, the Royal College of Physicians produced a highly alarmist report, which put together for figures for PM2.5 and NOx to give a clean total of 40,000 deaths per year caused by the two together. That's where this infamous 40,000 deaths per year, this zombie statistic that keeps on coming back um, every time it's debunked, comes from. Now, when I did my calculations, here's what I came up with. In my car, a Euro 5 diesel. <coughs> the social cost of the combined emissions of PM2.5 and NOx is 113 per year, 75 pounds of which is due to the manufacturer's fault in failing to keep to the standards the car was supposed to be built to. So only 38 is due to the car for, to me, actually driving the car. If it kept to the standards it was supposed to, the social cost would only be £38. Now, the £38 would buy me three ULEZ entry fees. That would pay for the social cost of the pollution, excluding the part due to the manufacturer's fault, caused by driving my car all over the UK for a whole year. Three entry fees. 
to the outer emission zone. That is over the top. Now, on social cost groans, I think you could say there is a case for charging Euro 3 and perhaps Euro 4 diesels, a small fee to drive in areas particularly badly affected by pollution. In fact, when all this um, came up, that was exactly what they said they would do. But then they went against it and they started banning cars. Um, so they went. Within a year to, from, oh, we're only going to charge for the worst polluted roads to, oh, now we're going to ban all petrol and diesel cars from 2040, which they're now trying to bring back to 2030. Um, and there might be possibly a small pollution charge of tens of pounds per year for Euro 5 and 6 diesel cars and for petrol cars older than 2001. But no more than that, and it should replace existing taxes, not add to them. I already play, pay hundreds of pounds more for my car in, in charges than would be um, the £38, pounds, which is the actual social cost of the pollution. And all this, of course, assumes the government figures I used are correct, but my suspicion is that in reality, they grossly overstated the toxicity of both PM2.5 and NOx. And if that turns out to be so, then pollution from cars is not, and never has been, a real problem, a practical problem in the real world. And yet the idiots in government have pressed on and they've banned all petrol and diesel cars from 2040. And all this comes about because the politicians in cahoots with the UN and the EU, their blood brothers, They've chosen to set hard, inflexible, and ever-tightening collective limits on what people may do. That is both crazy and tyrannical. As Edmund Burke said 250 years ago next year, bad laws are the worst sort of tyranny. And this is the worst sort of tyranny. To sum up, environmentalists and green campaigners in general, in both the war on cars and the global warming, have again and again used what I call the 10 deadly dishonesties. Number one, they have a thinly disguised hatred of our industrial civilization. But without themselves giving up its good things, no. They themselves want heating, they want lighting, they drive cars. Prince Charles goes on holiday by private plane. Number two, they like to move the goalposts. In really egregious ways, as I've heard you. Number three, they disguise politics as science. They dress up what ought to be science, and they actually take political control of it. Number four, the so-called scientists refuse to release data, or even may delete data. Number five, the environmentalist movement in general aims to suppress dissenting scientific views, as does all the media, the BBC explicitly in 2007 decided not to give equal airtime to the dissenting views as their charter binds them to. Number seven, they have inverted the burden of proof to make us prove that we are not causing a problem. Number eight, they have negated the presumption of innocence. Number nine, they have acquired they're accused, that's us to prove a negative, that we're not causing a problem. How can we do that? And number 10, they have made costly commitments on behalf of the people they're supposed to represent and to serve without any rigorous justification and without any concern whatsoever for our interests. We car drivers have been had, but we know it. And particularly in London, people are starting to become aware and concerned about this. And when the ULEZ goes out to the North and South Circular, I think we may have a gilet jaune situation on our hands. And maybe more than that, because the Brexit party is on the rise. Nigel Farage is a known climate change sceptic. I also believe that he is considerably pro-car, because he lives out in deepest Kent and he needs a car. I'm, I myself am now a member of the Brexit Party for my sins, and I am trying to gently push them in that direction as far as I can. Um, meanwhile, in the USA, something very interesting happened and unfortunately didn't happen. Donald Trump tried to commission a presidential commission committee sorry, on climate security to give a fact-based and unbiased examination of the topic of climate change. Unfortunately, he couldn't do that because his own party wouldn't let him. And 
Obviously, this is because enough Republicans are in on the scam too that they can't have Trump actually telling the truth and showing up the scam for what it is. However, Nigel Farage has no vested interests in that kind of thing. So it could be very interesting with the Brexit party. We've got a much better chance than Trump had, I think. The fight back, I think, is just beginning. We are living, indeed, in interesting times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, 15 minutes for questions. Are there any questions to go? Yeah, thanks very much for the talk. Um, excellent. Um, I, I've been saying for a long time that the environmentalists are the most dangerous ideology there is for our freedoms uh, because it, it is so uh, totalitarian. It, 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 it uh, affects every part of our lives, essentially. If, if you if you assume that emissions and energy and so on are a problem, they're deeply deeply uh, anti anti capitalism and, and anti industrialist societies, and uh, particularly it's this war on cars in the in the UK bothers me personally enormously because I, I love cars, and I think a lot of people, especially in, in urban areas in London, they think, well, why do you need a car? You know, I. Uh, I, I go on the tube every day and you can, can use public transport, which is true for maybe, uh, you know, an individual who just has a nine-to-five job, goes, goes in, into an office or whatever. Probably there are lots of people who don't need cars. If you live in London, if you live outside of London, however, cars are still very, very essential. And even in London, of course, if you have any kind of small business and have to transport anything, you still need cars. And what they don't realize is that if you ban cars, all these little businesses that do all these things that makes this city function will have a big, big problem. They will have to hugely increase prices, which will make life much more expensive in, 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 in the city. Or they will simply, simply get out of the city and then things are not get, getting done. And yeah. I think we might, we might have to have, get to some kind of complete standstill of certain things oh, yes. before, before some people wake up and, and, and yeah. see that they're supporting complete idiocy. Yeah, well, let, let me... Let me let me answer you in two ways. First of all, my own situation. I, when, when I'm on paid work, as I am at the moment, I, although I'm officially beyond retirement age, I have an eight and a half mile cross country journey to work. That takes 18 minutes by car each way. To go by bus, it takes an hour and three quarters and I cannot get back at all by bus unless I leave the office by quarter to five in the afternoon. Right? Forget it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could get some. Of it. I could do some of it by train. Not. I'm 66. I can't do that anymore. I live at. I live at the top of a hill as well. Um, I, you know, I used to bicycle. Right. I once went coast to coast across North America on a bicycle. Um, but anyway, the other uh, answer to your question, Nico, is it's not just the environmentalists themselves. It's what they cause the politicians to do. They got to the Tory Party. At, was it the 2017 election or the 2015? One of those. Suddenly, the Tories had heavy, deep green environmentalism in their manifesto. Mm. Well, they right. really organised these people. Right. The, the but the Tory party is supposed to be the party of the economy. Mm. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I think you have to say anyone that votes for the Tory party ever again has left the path of reason. <laughs> they were the original dreams of course, the Tories. The original anti-industrial revolution was the Tory party. The, the original reactionaries, they just became, uh, they were converted by the anti Corn Law League and the original Liberals appeal went over to liberalism and left, of course he split the Tory party and left the Tory party. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the original, and of course, you can say, and I often have said, socialism is just a new name for Toryism. <laughs> Well, it's the establishment. They're all, I mean, you know my views, David. They're all the same, basically, underneath. Well, they're all p p political animals trying to... And, of course, one of the reasons why they hate the car. They love the car. Mm. The it's car a, gives it's them also, power. It's also it's pleasurable. Yeah. They will go yeah. against... It, it's because it, it's a visible symbol of individuality and independence. Exactly. That's why they hate it. And, yeah, and they, they hate the whole um, thing that it makes... People are just as movable as they are. They like to fly in, in private planes and, and so on, but they want it for, 
just that they do it. They don't want to encounter the same people in, in the destinations they go to very expensively, like the ordinary people, because they hate being with this. They despise the ordinary bloke. And, and that's, that's, that's something that's going on when you, when you, when well, you see celebrities... Uh, uh, um, you know, advocating huge taxation of flights when they're themselves flying in private, private planes. But they can afford to fly first class, so yeah. it doesn't affect yeah. them. Exactly. Any more? That's it. Yeah, uh, brilliant talk. Um, Thank you. I wonder how you explain the uh, collusion of the Conservative Party in this debate. Well, uh, we've just been discussing that. Um, somebody got to them in about 2015 or thereabouts. I mean, going back to 1993 when it... Well, Zach, oh, yeah. Yes, well, there's John Major, yes. Yeah. Um, Zach Goldsmith, is he? But then, of course, it was... Well, Thatcher started it. So that there is a case that actually, <laughs> despite Blair and Brown, <laughs> that Labour haven't been as bad as the Tories on this issue, but they would be just as bad. Um, but do you think that with the Thatcher thing, it was partly because of her hatred for the coal miners and then... Uh, she uh, she's very pregnant. No, that was that yeah. was after the that was after the coal miners. That was nineteen eighty four was the coal miners. This was about nineteen eighty seven that, that right, she came that out. Her view on, on this. Yeah. Uh, yes, she's in favour of nuclear power. Yeah. He didn't like the yeah, yeah, NUM. Yeah. So, yeah. so yes, I mean the Tory party is very much to blame. Um, and I suppose the other issue within the Tory party, the only the sort of. Uh, divide along with the uh, the one nation wet and very into this environmentalist agenda and some of the others the traditional right less so I think uh, so it, it also gets mixed up in this um, the way that Cameron and May have detoxified the party by uh, deliberately selecting <coughs> Blairite candidates who've now infested pretty much the whole parliamentary party probably 70% of it at least who are obviously sort of on code with this green agenda because they're not actually conservatives, they're not classical liberals. Uh, well, certainly they're not classical liberals, but yeah, uh, yeah all I can say is yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't say two cheers for pollution in some ways. Um, the Victorian era, well, there's milk, there was brass, but there's also um, uh, purer water. Ceramic pipes, cheaper soap, cheaper bleach, etc., etc., etc. In other words, there were costs, but on balance, I'm not saying the pollution is good, but a little pollution, especially as a, if there's a great deal of benefit from the manufacturing process, is a good thing. Well, I, I um, the dirt led to a cleaner life. Uh, boiled shirts, starch, bleach, all the rest of it. People were actually, in the end, much better off. I mean, of course, by then they could afford to be more concerned with the pollution. Yeah, well, like the horse dung was a problem, let's face it. <laughs> yeah. if, there, if there is no dirt in the atmosphere, there'll be no rain. Well, <laughs> there has to be a certain amount oh, of dirt. It'll, the it'll be there anyway. Yeah, but just volcanoes and so on. Just to correct you on that, horse dung wasn't a problem. I mean, I, I remember when I was young, I used to go to Charlton, you know, collecting horse dung down the street because people had horses and cars and using it to grow uh, vegetables and what have you. Well, and, and you can't do that anymore. Well, I, I lived in a school and the school had horses and they made plenty of dung. It's <laughs> out for London, uh, as it was, can't seem to see salvation. Yes. Because yep. everyone was knee deep in dung. If you go up uh, the streets in Islington, there were raised pavements about two, one to two metres higher than the road. And they were there because the horse dung was so deep that the ladies in there long dresses didn't want to tread anywhere near it. Uh, and well, so why wasn't it cleaned away? It was. It was cleaned away with pulled by horse carts with the horses who were collecting it making more shit. Uh, and so <laughs> it, it, was a, it was an endemic problem. You couldn't get where was it going to go? Where are you going to pile all this stuff up, all this horse stuff? And so something that didn't smell moved a bit noisily, but not much noisier than the horses on cobbles and things, uh, came along and said, this is wonderful. Got rid of all the horse shit. Uh, well, uh, actually, I mean, uh, I, I don't remember horse stone smelling. Oh, it, it, it does. No, it, it does. It smells <laughs> sweet, though, as Swift said. <laughs> Depends how long you leave it. Very useful. Only if you have horses. Anyone else who's got that? Yeah.
Richard? Yeah, sorry to come again. Um, you, you've talked a lot about this, um, the role of the sort of supranational agenda, because obviously yes. environmentalism is often cross borders It suits the, gives them a rationale for supranational governments. But um, I wonder what way you would give to the influence of the public transport lobby, uh, particularly uh, this became stronger due to rail privatisation because uh, Tyler of BR, the, the, the private companies also had much bigger financial incentives to lobby for more uh, taxpayer subsidies to obviously they, rather than be paying that sort of service, they could get massive profits and bonuses, etc. Et yes, yeah. And they actually, um, the, the rail firms, of course, uh, uh, and the rail unions originally funded groups like Transport 2000, who were at the vanguard of the anti roads movement in the 1990s. Yes. And that, that was actually the, the link between the rail lobby and the anti roads protesters with groups like Transport yeah. 2000. So they could. Actually, direct line by the, 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 the rail lobby can't lobby help because they the, the rail lobby can't help you with cross country journeys, they simply are not those. So, I've always regarded their influence as limited. They may, in the publicity process, they may well have had a big um, input. And your mention of 19 of the privatization of railways made me think that's another thing that John Major, Major screwed up. Yeah, yeah, he screwed up the railways as well as mm -hmm. signing up to Rio. Yeah. Uh, and Andy was the one that started on the spy cameras and all that stuff as well. Dreadful or round like Dennis Thatcher said, he was one of the worst prime ministers ever, and he wished that the Tories had lost in 1992. Uh, mm. Yeah, uh, you know, what I, what I find a bit, a little bit strange is that if, if cows are as bad as we, we're told they are, and I've been for quite a long time, especially when you, you, they used to add lead to, to the petrol, and that was a major cause of pollution. Uh, Lead going in here, apparently, before it was banned. Um, why um, didn't they just simply put in new technologies to run the cars? They I have. Mean, that's just, that's but, exactly why they've been able to. Well, just, just I mean, just for example, for, I mean, the petrol shortage during the war uh, wasn't a problem because they used gas uh, to run vehicles. In fact, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen pictures of during the war in uh, London. You've got huge gas bags on top of uh, vehicles, and they're actually running off gas. And I would have thought that'd be a lot less polluting. I mean, when cars were, were first invented, <laughs> oddly enough, <laughs> to make the gas. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, I, 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 I mean, I'm not an expert on that technology, but I would have thought no, when we're told well, that gas is less polluting, then that's why we have gas-fired um, uh, power stations instead of coal-fired. I, I, gas I, is less pollution. That's what we're told. But, what but, I, 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 but, but when cars were first invented, um, they, they were designed to run off off plant oil, not not the, the, the you know the stuff we, we get out of the ground now, which from what I gather is a lot more uh, environmental friendly. But there's no reason why we couldn't change to that, for example. Oh. Um, and now there's, <laughs> that, that's the bioethanol stuff. That's <laughs> that that that's. It happens in the States and it's a failure. It doesn't do engines any good at all. It's, you mm. don't put too and much of it. Forests are destroyed by plantations. Some people actually started. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, they, they've got problems in the States uh, this year. Yeah. Poor harvest, all that corn that's gone for bioethanol, and our corn prices have gone up. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and I mean, as, as far as climate change we're talking about is concerned, I mean, really, whatever this country, I, I, I believe we're supposed to be. Um, uh, we're supposed to be zero, we're supposed to be carb, um, pollution free uh, by 2050, apparently. Um, so uh, I wonder, it doesn't really make any difference really, but as far as it's a global, uh, global situation because it's a drop in the ocean. I mean, well, the China, UK population China is 1% of the world population, so it's 1% one, it's 1 of the problem, mm -hmm. and, and if the problem is 1 degree, then the prob it's point one of a degree, and that's so all. Yeah, but China's opens a, a, a coal powered station, a gigantic coal power station, every week. Good. Every week. Yeah, good, 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 good for them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean someone's well, ignoring the dreams. <laughs> I, I support mean, Chinese, well, I haven't got electricity. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, that, every, everything that we do here, uh, I, I would have thought, you know, it might um, offset one of those powers, one of those weekly power stations for a week. If we're lucky, uh, I mean, it's laughable.
the, but uh, it, it, unfortunately, it's not laughable. Well, not for but, us. Uh, no, no for I mean, I, 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 that was really separate. We have, we have to have work wind turbines every so often because we've got more power than we need. Why don't we keep them spinning to generate hydrogen, or well, electrolyze water to, to create hydrogen that we can use for our vehicles? So the only, <laughs> only, the only output from the vehicle would be steam. Well, because, I, because you lose about 60 to 70% of it the doesn't energy. Matter. It doesn't matter. It's spare. It's not cost. It, it's, you know, no, it's, but it's, it's, it's always a cost. Yeah, yeah, right. but, but N the Nicker, whole thing yeah. is, is, I mean, yeah. yeah, I get you. If you have it, we, we might as well do it. But, but the whole thing is completely unproductive. <laughs> So we shouldn't have them in the first place. Okay, but since they're there, mm. and since they're sitting idle and we pay for them when they're idle, uh, why not leave, let them spin and electrolyze the water and distribute hydrogen? But then you need to build these constructions who do that, and they can, they can only work when you have an excess of electricity. So there's only a false, small fraction in the year where you can actually let them produce gas. Yeah. So that is that is in itself uneconomic. Like the gas and then they, they lose most of the... Yeah. 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 So you yep. just get it switched and, on and, and off because to yep. balance and, off. Uh, and, and the big, big problem is they're not reliable. Yeah. 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 Well, that's why for turbines you have to have a backup normal yeah. utility. Uh, running all, all the time in background in case the wind drops. But then you, you've got to pay twice over for your yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I just made, made to David the suggestion that perhaps we should ask Nickers to talk on that subject, energy. Oh, you mean a future talk? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were bringing up in the discussion. No, no, no. Future one. Yes, yes. Because there's an hour's worth there. Mm. At least. I, I, I can't take any side seriously that says carbon when they should be saying carbon dioxide. They know, they know full well, and they hope it has that effect, that people will think of soot somehow, or smoke, yeah. or dirt, or something that makes you uh, ill. And you, but what I say back to them is, carbon has an atomic weight of 12, carbon dioxide has a molecular weight of 44, yeah. so we only emit only a quarter as much carbon as you think we do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, those people that turned out to see did cop calling towers blow up the other day. Like, yeah. Oh, how wonderful that was. Well, where's the wonder in that? I can't see it. can't see it at all. I've, yeah, um, I, I suspect there's some uh, like international financial incentives here um, at, at play, which, which you didn't draw upon. For, uh, just just to give you a simple example. Um, that, that would be the um, carbon tax. You know, which is you know about the carbon tax, which oh, companies yeah. pay for, which they want uh, third world countries to pay for as well. Which, which, which that's that's been in place for years. Yes, they just call it different taxes. things. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of financial engineering going on involved in this as well, and, and that's another bank story. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, mean, I, I, I got a confession to make. Well, <laughs> switch, I mean, switch your camera off. <laughs> uh, well, well, I think we're going to to make it after the meeting pack because we're, uh, we're up to four to nine now and Nico's going to go up. Yeah. So, uh, then as a meeting, gra yeah. graduate the, uh, of the University of East Anglia. Hang on, uh, yeah. make it after the meeting here, in fact, because we, we've got to end the meeting now. Okay, okay. But one of the things you didn't dwell on, and I think it's, it's very important, Continue up is, this, is the, in the ozone this creates. Well, no, no. well, that, that, is, <laughs> that is one thing which does damage. That's what they started. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, but you didn't touch on that. No, Two minds are worth a single thought, yes. yes. You didn't touch on that. I just, I just no, I, well, I, I, only, I only had a limited time. Cool. Thank you for the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.